And Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with some red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom, which means red. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I'm about to die. So what is its birthright to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread too. He threw some bread in. <laughs> How nice of Jacob. And stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Then Esau despised his birthright. Will you do me a favor? I'm going to stretch my hand this way and pray for you that you'll hear God's word today. And I want you to stretch your hand this way and you pray for me that God will use me as his vessel today. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the story that we're reading today. Thank you for your word, uh, both Old Testament and New Testament, Lord, that shows us your character, shows us, um, Lord, how we should respond to you and how we should react. Now, Lord, I pray for these people today, Lord, as they hear the reading of your word, as they hear this kind of expositional story, Lord, may they hear from you more importantly than they hear from me. May your Holy Spirit abide here with us and speak deeply to our hearts today a message from you. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right, let me tell you a little backstory about uh, this. Uh, I want to start actually back with Abraham. Actually, I'll start earlier than that. Here's what God's up to. If you zoom all the way, this story is in Genesis, so it's really close to the beginning, right? It's really close to the beginning of this whole thing. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. God created mankind. He wanted to walk with them in the cool of the day, wanted to have this relationship. I believe God had a design for this big family that included him, included um, us as humans. That's the way he meant it. That's what he wanted. Well, man fell. You know the story. And as it goes, time goes on. Here Scott has another idea, and he says, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a people from humanity. And so he grabs this guy named Abraham, and he tells him, you're going to have descendants as many as the stars because I'm making a people. You're going to be my people, and I'm going to be your God, is what he says to Abraham. And then so the family business from that point on, Abraham's family, his business became being God's people and making babies, okay? Multiply and, and build this family people up. That was the family business, all right? So, so he had, Abraham had Isaac, and then Isaac had Esau and Jacob. Okay, so you're with me in the story? We're trying to make a people. We got Isaac, who's having these two sons, Esau and Jacob. So this whole birthright thing, keep in your mind, this birthright thing is so important. So let's read some of the, um, I'm sorry, before I read some of the backstory, let me, let me read a little bit about birthright. Here's something I found in Dad's cool study Bible here. In this culture... The firstborn son was customarily given the birthright. The receiver of this birthright took headship of the family and took a double share of the inheritance. Pretty, pretty good. All right. And, and then also it noted in this culture, the firstborn could sell the birthright to a brother if he so chose. In this lineage, however, it's, it's, it's just interesting to note that the birthright was so important because they were the family business, being God's people and making babies. So the person who led that, it was very important. Do you see the importance of this lineage? And by the way, let me just go a little further. After Jacob and Esau and after all this happens, a lineage of people who outnumber the stars, they say, I mean, this really happened. We know them as the Jewish people, the Hebrews, whatever. Maybe that's in your background. I don't know. But you're, if you're a descendant of Abraham, you know, that might be in your background. But I will say this, that God's promises did come true. And guess what? What other people didn't know, that was all leading to Jesus. And that was all leading to what we just celebrated at Christmas when Jesus came to this earth. And he came to save us. That whole lineage was all about reconciling mankind, all of mankind, not just the Jewish people, not just those folks, but all of us being reconciled, and he used the lineage of Abraham to bring Jesus, right? You with me? So there's the big zoomed out purpose. That's the big zoomed out thing and why the birthright is so important. Now let's zoom down into 
uh, the backstory. Let's start first talking about our boy Esau. Esau, uh, in these scriptures, you'll see that he's red, he's hairy, he's outdoorsy, he's a skilled hunter, and he's a daddy's boy. All right, so you don't think I'm just making this stuff up. I'll read it for you a little bit here. Here's Genesis 25. Let's scoot back to verse 21 if you've got your Bible still open. This is not going to be on the screen, but I'll read it. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. I'll pause right there. Isn't that amazing? These two guys were fighting before they were born. And the mom's like, what is going on with this? I thought this was the promise of God, and this is killing me. I never knew what it felt like to really bear a child. But those of you who have, maybe, you know, just take the kicks and the bumps and all the bladder issues and, like, <laughs> multiply them, okay? That's what she was saying. She was like, God, what's up with this? And God was telling her, don't worry, actually, there's two in there. And she goes, okay, that makes sense. And, and actually, they're going to be two different nations, and they're going to struggle with each other, okay? So moving on, let's see, verse 25. And the first came out red, and he was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So he's like, I want to be first. No, I want to be first. No, I want to be first. So to get out about the same time, he grabbed his heel, right? I can't believe these babies had this, like, sense inside of them. Okay, but anyway, so he grabbed Esau's heel, and so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when, uh, when she, I'm sorry, Isaac was 60 years old when she bore the sons to them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. So you can see where I got that from. Esau's this hairy guy. He's, he's a hunter. He is a man's man. He shops at Home Depot. I mean, he's, you know, he's this awesome dude, okay? And he's a daddy's boy. Dad's proud of him. He's like, yeah, that's my boy. If you taste that venison, that's good. You know, like, I mean, he, the, he, he's a dad's boy, you know, so he's... He's all of that in a ball of wax. And then we have Jacob. It notates in the scripture he must have been smaller. He must have been weaker. Um, they call him a hill snatcher because of how he was born. Uh, he also was kind of, a, he's kind of a little shysty guy. He was a deceiver. Look at his face. Can't you tell? He's like, he's got his hand behind his back. He's like, hmm, okay. All right. So um, he's kind of a little shysty. He's a deceiver. He was an inside person. It says he dwells in tents. Okay, so he was an inside guy. And he was a mama's boy. He was Rebecca's favorite. Okay, so that's your little backstory about Jacob and Esau. Now let me just tell you, think about this for a minute. In light of who these boys are, in light of this birthright, in light of all this stuff that's happened, Jake, uh, let, me, let me bring something up here. Esau, get a picture of him again. Esau's out there hunting. And he's out there wearing himself out hunting. He's probably taking it past the limits to go hunt. Why? Well, obviously, he receives his identity from hunting. It gives him favor with his dad. That's important to him. I don't know about you, but I have those things in my life. Sometimes I overdo it. And I overdo it because I get my identity from it. Or I think someone's going to see it and say, Good job, Billy. You know, I'll, I'll sometimes wear myself out. Does anybody else do that? Anybody else do that? Wear yourself out, trying to impress somebody? Okay, maybe uh, nobody's raising their hand because they don't want to impress anybody. I understand. <laughs> okay, but um, maybe it's just me. But anyway, I, I can see Esau doing that. He's taking it past the limits, okay? And he's trying to receive this identity. And so he wears himself out. He comes out of the field, and here's Jacob, you know. Who knows if Jacob was making the stew, to actually trip up Esau here, or who knows if he was just making stew because he wanted stew. But I can see Jacob here with his crock pot, and he's made him some stew, and you know, and he's, he's over here as, as Esau comes, he can be like, oh, here he comes. 
Mmm. Mmm. Doesn't that smell good, Esau? Mmm. I'm sure Esau stunk a little bit from hunting. But um, so here it is. He's got his bowl of stew, and they have this little conversation. And of all things, Jacob sells this little bowl of stew. I know he threw in a little piece of bread, too, thanks. And he sells it to his brother for his birthright. Now, why would Esau do such a thing? I think if Esau could come back after knowing everything that I told you about how this lineage, it, was, you know, it came out of this lineage, and then there was a people, and there was Joseph, and then there was Moses, and there was the, the Red Sea, and then there was David and Solomon, and then from David and Solomon came Jesus. I think if Esau could like right now come back to us now in 2012, almost 2013, he'd say, say no to the stew. Okay, say no to the stew. It could have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But it's not. It's, it's, God is known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? Stew. Stew. Okay, it's kind of crazy. It's silly that he would do such a thing. But he did it. He did it. And you know what's interesting is God honored that little deal. I'm sure he didn't have to, but he honored it. You want to know why? I think he honored it, not because Jacob's this awesome character. I actually don't, I'm not, I don't want you to walk away from today's sermon saying, oh, be more like Jacob and trick everybody. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Okay, so don't, they, Jacob got better later in his life. Trust me, he got, he got to be a better person. He had to walk his own path and he had to deal with his own stew selling later. Okay, but I will say this, God honored what he did because he saw Esau's heart. He saw Esau was about impressing people with how he could hunt and impressing his dad. He wasn't really in his heart. He didn't look at this birthright as a calling from God. And he thought of it so small, he just tossed it for a bowl of stew. I think that's why God honored it. And now the lineage is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, I think there's some life skills. I always like to open the Bible. Let me tell you, the Bible is awesome. Okay, and I don't just say that because I'm like, I'm supposed to say it as a preacher and all this stuff. No, I think, I think, I tell you what, I've studied the Bible in my life and I've looked over it and I'm still studying the Bible and I'm still looking over it and it's still alive to me and it is because the Bible is awesome. Okay, and if you don't read it, you should read it. It's great stuff. Now today, I don't want my sermon to be about life skills and just be a feel good, like, you know, do a little better people act a little better and and you'll be better. I don't want it to be that kind of sermon, but I want you to note with me some life skills that are in this in this story and we'll talk about the spiritual implications in a minute. Here's some life skills I thought of. <clears throat> this can affect any decision. They say that we make up to 5,000 decisions in a day. Can you believe that? I just made a decision to say that to you. And the other day I made a decision to write it down. You made a decision to come to church and hear me say that. Okay, so we're all like making decisions all the time, right? We're making all these decisions, some big, some small. Some have future implications and some don't, okay? Uh, so I, I, would say, I would say we make 5,000 a day. Decision-making skills as a life skill is very important. And I think about the life skill I can learn from this. I'll tell you where I can apply this story to my life is think of it financially, when you think of investments or budgeting, you know, you can think of this. Sometimes, and in your notes, you'll see this little statement. I want to show it to you on the screen, and you can fill in the blanks if you want to. Sometimes our appetites can lead us to trade what is ultimate for what is immediate. I'm going to say it again. Sometimes our appetites can lead us to trade what is ultimate for what is immediate. And I like to thank Andy Stanley for that little, that little quote there. Okay? So sometimes that thing we want really bad, that immediate impulse, it can cause us to trade this ultimate great thing for what's immediate. Let's talk about it financially. Sometimes we can go out and spend a lot of money that we don't really have and then later on be stuck with the debt. 
And later on, we're paying out the nose and we're paying interest and it hurts and it's painful. And we traded that ultimate thing of financial peace later, we traded it for that immediate, I got it, cha-ching. Okay, I got one of those. My wife and I, it's been almost 10 years now. In about eight months, it'll be 10 years. We actually took a vacation. We lived in Atlanta. We took a vacation down here to South Florida. And on our vacation, we spent like a week down here, and it was awesome. And we were kind of in the Fort Lauderdale, Miami area. And on our way back, we just kept talking about how much we hate this gray van that we have. We just kept talking about this gray van we have. You know, it ran fine. It looked okay. It worked. You know, it was a working car. It was gray. It was not pretty. And none of us looked cool getting out of it and driving in it. Okay? But it was fine. Well, we kept talking on our vacation about this ugly gray van. So what did we do? On our way back from vacation, we stopped at Daytona Dodge in Daytona, Florida, and we picked up a brand new 2003 red Dodge Stratus. Yes, we did. Brand spanking new. Okay, the last brand spanking new car I've ever bought, just so you know. It was $22,000, has a sunroof and power windows and air conditioning and a cool spooler on the spo uh, spoiler on the back, and it is still to this day, it's parked right out here, still to this day, a sharp looking car. It's almost 10 years old, and the headlights are green, you know, like they do, but, but it's still a good-looking car, and it still drives okay. Now, I've spent about $2,400 on it the last two years, fixing it back, getting, keeping it running. But I will say, think about it. I paid $22,000 plus interest, and I want you to know something. We wanted to pay off the car because somewhere else in our life, we wanted a bigger house, and so what we had to do was consolidate our debt. Anybody ever do that? Okay, so we took some credit cards, and we took what was left on the car, and we went, and guess what? We played on the car for way longer than the five years we originally were going to. You with me? And we paid interest on that. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Okay, I was dumb. All right, now, I love the car. It's been a good car. I, I, don't, I don't regret. God's made it a good thing for me and blessed our family with a car that still runs. It's got 125,000 miles on it, and it's still ticking. All right, so I'm glad and I'm blessed with my car. Thank you, God. But I will say, in the moment, I traded ultimate financial peace and harmony in my house for what just looked so good, and it just seemed so right, and I loved the way it sounded, and I loved that sunroof. I mean, I just, I mean, I traded that ultimate thing for that immediate high. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, that's how we can do it financially. Uh, I love what Dave Ramsey says. If you haven't taken uh, financial peace, I highly recommend it, especially coming into a new year. I highly recommend financial peace for you if you've not taken it. And in that thing, he makes a statement when he talks about budgeting. He talks about how you need to figure out how to live like no one else so later you can live like no one else. And he's talking about bringing down your lifestyle so that you can save money so that later... You can live like no one else. And that's what he's saying he did. And he's suggesting that we think that way too when he's teaching financial peace. And it's been great. And right now, my wife and I, we are trying to do that. We, you know, we cut cable this past year. We cut, we cut, we slice budget. My wife's cutting coupons. I mean, we're like trying our best. And we actually, we, we paid off her other car. We have a, a other car. And we paid off that car this past year. We're, we're knocking the door down on some debt, and we're hoping to be debt-free in 2013. Yeah. So we're working hard on that. But I tell you, it makes some, right now, we, we, we face it every single day. I go, hmm, I could, I could use a Starbucks right now. Hmm, I, I think I need it. I think I need the five bucks. I mean Starbucks. I think I need it. And I, I get to choose right then if I'm going to go do that or if I'm going to trade that immediate little pleasure for the ultimate thing of, no, we have a budget. No, I'm not pulling out my debit card and swiping it. I got my $15 cash allowance for this week. <laughs> and when that money's gone, the money's gone, okay? And so that's, that's, that's in a way we're trading that now. We're trying to start to live that way. We finally got the clue that that's a better way to be. 
Because then at home later, you're going, actually, we paid all the bills early. And there's nothing else to do. And there's like $25 left over. Let's get a coupon and go to Chili's. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's what we do. Exactly what we do. Um, and celebrate. Okay. So it's, 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 it's an awesome thing. Now, what about time management? This is a life skill you can learn from this. Don't tra- say no to the stew when it comes to time management. Okay, figure out how to work your life so you're not freaking out all the time. I need to get better at this. I need to do better. We can make decisions that will help us ultimately that don't necessarily feel good in the moment. I admit I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit of a workaholic. And sometimes I, I need, I, I work too, a little too much and a little too hard to achieve something that most people won't even notice. And I do this, and I'm struggling with this, and I will do this with my time management sometime, and sometimes I'm realizing now when I'm doing that, I'm actually trading a more ultimate thing. I could be home with my little girl. I could be home with my wife. I could be home with my two boys, and we could be spending some family time together, but instead, I keep working on this thing. I don't know why I keep doing it. I'm kind of like Esau, working too hard, hunting, and then coming home and having nothing left, but he trades his birthright for stew. Okay, so that's time management. Maybe you're, you're a guy or, or a lady who works hard and, you know, you do that. I want to suggest to you in 2013, start making some decisions for the ultimate. Start making some decisions for the bigger picture in life and start, start choosing that instead of that immediate thing. Okay, so maybe that'll, maybe that'll speak to you in some time management. Maybe, maybe not. What about relationships? Ooh, everybody say, ooh. What is the stew in relationships? Well, sometimes you get in a stew in relationships. And uh, how many married folks we got here? You're, you're married? Okay, good. A lot of us. So this, this should hit home with me. Here's something I've, I've learned. Um, I haven't really learned. There's something I know that I'm trying to turn into action, if you know what I'm saying. I know that sometimes when I get a little disagreement with my wife or a little disagreement with one of my children and we have a little fight, I know that sometimes... <clears throat> You ever heard of the idea of winning the battle but losing the war? You ever heard of that before? Sometimes my need to win the fight, to have the final word, for my side of the story to really be heard and really be seen with all clarity. Sometimes I will trade that for the ultimate thing, which is really keeping some peace in my home, and keeping open lines of communication in my relationships. Right? And everybody said, ooh. Is this stew starting to smell a little stinkier to you? Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. <clears throat> say no to the stew. Everybody say that. Say no to the stew. Okay. Okay. Uh, how many are not married? You're, you're kind of in a single lifestyle. Okay. I got one for you. You ready? You said it right. Uh oh. What about dating? What about sex? What about that kind of stuff? You know what'd be ultimate? If you kept a lifestyle of dating and you kept that lifestyle clean. And one day you have that right person and you guys get on in a, in a marriage ceremony and it gets to the end and you know. You have saved your very best for that other person. You saved your very best, and you've kept your life clean. Or maybe, maybe you've already done something. Hey, listen, it's you know, mercy and grace are present. But listen, from this point on, you can be different. We're about to start a new year, aren't we? We're about to start a new year, so it can change today. Okay, and and you can do dating and relationships. And those kind of physical things differently from today on. And what I'm trying to say, what's immediate, what's really tempting and immediate is to go ahead and do the stew, okay, in relationships. Don't look at me like I've never dated. (laughs) Don't look at me like, you know, I never had a girlfriend or something, okay? I have, two, okay, but uh, (laughs) no, no. I'm kidding. Uh, But anyway, like, I know this is not easy, but say no to the stew. 
Say yes to what's ultimate. Say yes to what's greater. Don't trade what's ultimately greater out there for what is just a temporary pleasure right now. Those some good life skills that are in this story. Those are just a few. I hope that you'll look at this story and maybe think of more that more apply to you um, in your life. But there's way more implications than that. And really what I want to talk, what I really want to bring out today is the spiritual implications that are here. This is not just life skills. And uh, I want to say this, um, if you'll throw up the slide that says spirit man versus flesh man. Okay, to kind of set this up, I'm going to give you another visual. Now you've had Jacob and Esau as a visual, so go with me here. Go back with me to Sunday school in the 80s. My Sunday school teacher, her name was Sis Arrington. Miss Sis, we called her. She's my hero. She was awesome. She, she didn't actually teach Sunday school. She taught children's church. And in children's church, she taught us the spirit man versus the flesh man. And here's what she did. She would take her big old husband with a big pot belly. And, and he would come on the scene. And then she would take her scrawny little son, whose arm was about that big around. His name was Tim. He was my friend. I went to school with him. And, and he would come in. So you'd have this big, tall, burly get man. And you have this little guy. And here's what they would sit down at a table together. And she would say it like this. She would say, when a decision comes, there's two people inside of you. There's a spirit man and there's a flesh man. And whoever you feed will win. Because they're at war. And there's a battle inside of you. And then so she would take a bowl like this and she would set it in front of the flesh man and sometimes she'd have little labels on it. She would talk about certain kinds of music or certain kind of movies or certain kind of games or, or, or something like that. She would have some examples of things like that. You know, maybe some inappropriate talk, inappropriate hanging out with inappropriate people who are saying and doing inappropriate things. Okay, and she would say that was what she was feeding the flesh man, right? Because it's kind of like feeding the flesh. And, and he would just gobble it up. I mean, this guy was a great actor. He would just... I mean, he would just gobble it up. And then she would say that moment of decision, look. And she'd have him stand up, and she'd have the little skinny guy stand up. And now they're going to fight. What do you think's going to win? Obviously, the big man's going to win. And then she would say, now what if, instead, you fed the spirit man? What if you read your Bible? What if, instead of, you know, that kind of music, you listen to this kind of music? What if you went to church every time you got a chance? What if you gotten with a group of people that, you know, that would talk about good things instead of inappropriate things? And so she started talking about that. And she's like, then you could feed your spirit man, and then when the war takes place and the decision point comes, guess who wins? The spirit man. Are you guys tracking with me? Didn't I have a great children's church teacher? She was awesome. Sis Arrington, I don't know if you ever would see this, but I love you. You're awesome. And her daughter's doing it now and doing a great job. Same thing. So anyway... Um, I want to say that that, was, that stuck with me my whole life. I was probably six or seven years old when I heard that. And that little imagery has stuck with me my whole life. So I'm glad to be able to share it with you. Here's where I think that comes from. Ken, if, you're, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me in Romans 8. There's a lot of great scriptures about the spirit man, the flesh man, and this war that we have. But I want to go to this one in Romans 8 because it says some amazing things. I think that apply to us. And I'm actually going to read it from the message version. It's, uh, it says it really plainly and powerfully. So let me, let, let, me, let me say it this way. Here's Romans 8, 12. Everybody there? All right, here we go. So do not see, oh, sorry, so do you not see that we don't owe this do-it-yourself life? I'm sorry, there's one missing scripture there. Is there Romans 8, 5, Tom? Is there a five? Oh, there's not a five. Okay, I'm going to read that from here then, because it's important. Sorry about that. We're going to swap, do the version swap. I'll get five up for the second service. Here's what 8.5 says. For those who live according to the flesh, or the flesh man, set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is at enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So those who are in the flesh cannot please God. 
Now hear what this is saying. If you're living according to the flesh, if you're letting the flesh man win every battle, you can't please God. It's not possible. And let me, let me, let me, get, this, let me get this straight with you. This has nothing to do with like, you've got to be a better person, you've got to act a better way to get the approval of God and, and make Him love you. Let me tell you, God already loves you. God already loves you. Okay, that, done, that thing is settled and done on the cross of Jesus Christ. What else has he got to do to prove it to you? What else? He loves you. Okay, if you hear nothing else today, hear me. God loves you. And it doesn't matter if you're winning the spirit man, flesh man battle. Here's what he's talking about, pleasing God. He's talking about you can't really get in on the kingdom of God and what he's doing in this world if you're continuing to live according to the flesh. You see what I'm saying? You can't be in the family business and further the family business if you're just trading it for stew all the time. And you're just doing what the immediate flesh thing wants. If you're just doing that, you can't, be, you can't do in the family. What happened to Esau? He, he wasn't in the family business. Now God didn't make that choice for him. Who made that choice? He did. He sold it for stew. And something inside of him, he chose the flesh man in that, in that choice. Let's move on. Now, I think I will read from this one. Here's what else it says in Romans 8, verse 12, skipping down. So don't you see that we don't owe this do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is give it a decent burial and get on with your life. God's Spirit beckons there are things to do and places to go this resurrection life you receive from god is not a timid grave tending life it's adventurously expectant greeting god with the childlike what's next papa god's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are how many of us in this world want to know who we really are we know who He is, and we know who we are. Father and children. Moving on. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us. An unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through if we go through the hard times with Him. And then we're certainly going to go through the good times with Him. And that's why I don't think there's any comparison between the present hard times and the coming good times. Now, keep that right there for me, Tom. Now, I want to make note of a few things in this scripture. I, I've, I've been so excited to get to this point in the message because I feel like God landed a bomb on me when I found this scripture and looked up this scripture and, and, and saw this connection. Check this out. We're talking about flesh man, the spirit man. Esau chose the flesh man when he, when he traded it for the stew. Okay, now check this out. This is talking about that battle. And then here's what he says. Don't you know who you are? You're a child of God. And guess what that means? You're an heir. You have a birthright. You have an inheritance because you're a child of God. Let me tell you, folks. Don't trade your inheritance for a bowl of stew. Say no to the stew. And then check it out. I love it. It says, we go through the hard times with him, and we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. What are those hard times? In the New King James Version, it says, we suffer with Christ. What does that mean? Living like no one else. So that someday we can live like no one else. And I'm not talking about money, folks. I'm not talking about money when I say that this time. Hear me out. What are, what are the hard times? Saying no to the stew. Saying no to that temporary pleasure that it looks so good. It has a sunroof. <laughs> he has blue eyes. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, whatever that temporary pleasure is for you, don't sell your soul for it. It's not worth it. I mean, you know this to be true, right? We all know. Yeah, that's true. How hard is it to actually do? How do we actually do it? Okay, this is the suffering I think he's talking about. Now, I love this last thing. It says, that's why, Paul says, I don't think there's any comparison between these present hard times of saying no to the stew 
and the coming good times with him. Your birthright, your inheritance, don't trade it. Now here's what I'll say, great. Okay, everybody said, okay, Billy, great. Yes, say it with me. Say no to the stew. Yes. All right, you're, everybody nod your head like, I got you. Good, good. Yeah, but how? Yeah, but how? Well, if you back up in the scripture, back up one more, one more slide for me there, Tom. There's something, something about living by the Spirit that's in there. Maybe it's a scripture I don't, I don't have on you. It's that, it's that verse 5. If you want to go back to Romans 8, verse 5, here's what it talks about. Live according to the Spirit, not the flesh. It's that whole scene where Miss Sis taught us to feed the spirit man. How do you do it? You feed the spirit man. You make a plan. You make space for the Holy Spirit in your life. And isn't it interesting we call our plan that we're challenging you to do, the 31-day experience, what is it called? The University of the Holy Spirit. I think it's said beautifully. It might be confusing at first when you hear that. It was to me. Well, now I get it. And if you'll do it, you'll get it too. You're learning how to feed the Spirit, man. How to turn your life over to control of the Holy Spirit. And then when 5,000 decisions a day over 365 days of 2013 come your way, you have the strength, you have the power, you have the wisdom to say no to the stew and yes to the Spirit. You have the wisdom to say no to what's temporary and yes to what's ultimate. You have the strength and the power to turn it down, to turn down the volume of the flesh and crank up the volume of the Spirit in your life. You can do it. It takes a little work on your part. They call it suffering in the Bible. They call it hard times. God's, God knows us. God knows it's not easy. Will you join together with me, 2013, in saying no to the stew? Let's pray together. God, what a challenging word we have been given today. Lord, what a hard thing it is, Lord, to say no to all the pleasures, all the difficult uh, ways that it is to, to turn down the offer that the world gives us and that the flesh so desires and longs for. Lord, I pray that you would teach us how to be a people who do what it says in the Scripture and just go ahead and give the flesh a nice little burial ceremony and go ahead and put it behind us. Lord, that's... It sounds so good, and the reward sounds so good. But in real life, on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday, it's really difficult to do. So, Lord, I pray that you would plant this seed deep within our hearts. And, Lord, I pray that it would come out at the right time, and it would be in front of us in the right moments, in one of those 5,000 decisions in a day that's going to have a long-term effect to it. Lord, will you bring this to our memory and Lord, will we choose the Spirit? Will we choose our inheritance in you? Will we choose the family business? Lord, we love you so much. And inside of us is also this desire to please you. This desire to be in on what you're doing in this world. Lord, it's made obvious by this giving that we've been doing to support your kingdom. Lord, and I pray that you would continue to, to, to turn a fire within us to desire the things you desire and to be a part of what you're doing. With every head bowed, head still bowed and eyes still closed, I just wonder if there's anybody in here that you just feel like you've been living life according to the flesh and you've never really made any kind of commitment to turn that life around and to turn it over to the Spirit. And you come today as maybe one of the last things you do in 2012 and you decide, I want 2013 to be different. I want to claim for the first time Jesus as my Lord. I want to claim that I want to lay down this life of the flesh and try to strive for the life of of the Spirit. Now every head is bowed, every eye is closed, but if you will just lift your head 
and make eye contact with me. That's what you want to do today. If you want to make a decision for Christ, would you just lift your head and make eye contact with me and I'll try to find you. I see you, sir. I see you, ma'am. I see you, ma'am. see you, sir. I see you, ma'am. I see you, sir. I see you, ma'am. I see you, ma'am. And if I didn't get to make eye contact with you and nod at you, I see you, ma'am. Don't feel like you've been left out. God sees what you're doing. God sees that you're saying no to the stew. You're saying yes to him. Welcome to the family business. Let's say a word of prayer together. Can we all say this together, church, in support of those who are making this difficult decision today? Dear Lord, I'm a sinner. Everyone say it, repeat it after me. Dear Lord, I'm a sinner. I have chosen my flesh over and over again. And it's gotten me into a lot of trouble. I pray that you will deliver me. By the blood of Jesus, you will cover my sins and welcome me in to your family. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. And I thank you for the Holy Spirit that you're sending me. Strengthen me now that I may walk and I may talk according to the Spirit. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Hey, let's celebrate the life change that God is doing in our church. If you're one of those people, I just want to I, I wanna just say to you, we kind of do this in a private manner. As everyone's leaving, there are prayer team members right up here on either side. We would love, I, I, I plead with you, we would love it if you would come forward and share that with a prayer team member. It's so important that your first step as a new family member is you get to know another family member. And you get to know someone and you tell them what you did. All right? And anybody else who would like to